The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. I'm good here. Thank you, everyone. I want to say first off, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I know you've got a lot of different choices you can make today, and, and I'm glad you found your way here. Um, just as a quick introduction, my name is Michael Coburn. I'm a consultant with Percona, where we do uh, database consulting, uh, MySQL, and performance uh, really anywhere in the LAMP stack. Um, we do help out some customers who are on non-Linux, on Windows, and on FreeBSD, and other things like that, too. So. Um, if you guys are ever in the market for needing some help with any projects or looking for support agreements, we're there to help you. Um, the, the, the nature of my talk today, what I'm trying to help all of you in the room is to understand what goes into a database when you're looking to source hardware for it. I named the talk Choosing Hardware for MySQL. It's applicable to any other database out there. I'm going to be talking about specific things within MySQL, different ways it uses memory and stuff like that. But if you can like, maybe take a step back when you're hearing that if you're not a MySQL user, It'll apply to your other database product as well. Um, I'm also not going to be standing up here pushing any particular vendor. Uh, I'm not going to say Fusion IO is better than Verdin or anything like that. You can make those decisions yourselves. And we've got benchmarks on, on the SSD performance blog and things like that that you can look at and evaluate those metrics. Um, I'm here more to educate you on what are some of the paradigms and thought processes you might want to go through. OK? Um, so here we go. So we're going to cover off a number of different sections. Uh, I really want to share with you some numbers you've probably seen before. We're going to talk about where things are faster than other things. I'll get to that right away. We'll talk a little bit about what it means in a CPU for using a database, uh, some about the memory utilization and also how it uses disk. Uh, we're going to look at what's the impact of the network on your database server. Um, touch quickly on the Amazon cloud. I'm not touting them in any particular case, but AWS is the largest cloud provider, so most people are most familiar with it. So we, t we just use that as a use case. And then last, we'll just talk about a few components of running MySQL on different types of hardware. Okay. So before I, actually, before I get too far, can I just maybe take a quick hands in the air? Anybody use MySQL today? OK, most of you? Good. I'm glad to see our Oracle representative <laughs> is a MySQL user, too. Um, are any of you um, responsible in any regard to either offering advice or actually making the purchase orders for new hardware? OK. Good. OK, good. And you know, this can be anywhere from your large college campuses where you're buying hundreds of servers down to maybe you know, you know, you're trying to figure out if you need to go to the cloud or go somewhere to some provision hardware. Uh, this, this, kind of, this slide deck should help you get through that. OK. Um, I think I touched on most of the stuff. I, I do list it as beginner, intermediate. Um, feel free. This is a small enough group for it. If you have questions as I'm going through it, just raise your hand. I'm happy to stop where I'm at, and we can talk it through. I, I fully expect also that you're going to have differences of opinion where, where I go on, on some, some of these angles. So if you do and you're not afraid to share it, raise it up and we can talk it through. OK? OK, so everybody should know that in the stack, likely your hard disk is going to be your bottleneck in terms of slowness. OK? I don't think we'll have any disagreements there. On the high end, you've got things like the CPU cache, which are going to be faster than anything else. In between, we've got things like the RAM, which we've labeled as memory, and we've got flash storage and SSD. This isn't really to scale, but the significance is, is as you go from the bottom to the top, this is the, this is the metrics we're going to be working with. OK, Okay. this is a cool set of numbers that I think somebody at Google had posted a few years ago, and it's made its way around the internet just a little while ago again. Um, basically, what it's showing is, is a, the ratio of getting an operation done at each of these different types of memory spots, CPU registers, uh, uh, using the network, using a hard drive, all these kinds of things. So what I'm trying to show here, though, is that it's orders of magnitude faster to be doing things in the CPU. And then the next thing is it's faster to do things in memory, between memory and the CPU. And as you crawl all the way down to the network, you're looking at something like 150 milliseconds to be bouncing a packet from California to Netherlands and back. Okay. So try, just trying to keep these, these paradigms in mind, these, these, these lengths of time it takes to do things. And we're going to come back to these kinds of numbers later on. Okay. When you source for a CPU, you've got a bunch of different choices that you need to factor in, both from within your application and also from what the hardware vendor is telling you about what their CPUs can do. Uh, you need to think about how scalable your app needs to be. 
Okay? Are you in the model where you need to put everything on a single host because your developers don't have the time to implement read-write splitting in your application? Or are you already ready to be doing sharding and what you're going to do is source many, many servers and only have smaller sets of data on each and you need to go with smaller sets of CPU? These are things you need to decide with your development team when you're, when you're coming up with your application. So depending on where you're at in that space, it's going to influence the CPU choices that you make. Okay? Um, CPUs can also be a large source of mutex contention, so you need to watch out that they don't become a bottleneck just by virtue of having either too many or too few cores. Um, we're going to look at different types of response time and throughput that a particular CPU can deliver. Now, there was a big race for a number of years ago where it was, let's get faster clock speeds on these things. Every year, you know, you'd see going up by half a gigahertz, and, you know, we kind of peaked out around this three or this four gigahertz range right now. Well, now we've seen a lot more of the vendors go to multi-core architecture. And as that's changed, as the hardware vendors have kind of led this path, we've followed with the applications follow that. So what I mean is MySQL used to be, you know, let's go for single-threaded work workloads because we're seeing the CPUs get so fast that your single-threaded workload last year is just faster by virtue of a faster CPU this year. And that was good enough for most people. Well, with the change to multiple cores, uh, MySQL back in the 5.0 days was only happy with maybe four cores, anything beyond that, and it didn't really utilize them. But these days, you know, you could be looking at numbers around 24 cores as a sweet spot for MySQL. Um, the people from Oracle will have some, some different angle on that too. Um, 5.6 is going to introduce a whole different paradigm, but if you're on a, a MySQL 5.5 implementation, shopping around the 24 core is a pretty sweet spot in terms of what MySQL can do and what your budget's going to allow. You realize as you go to more cores and fitting in a number of sockets in a server, that's going to make that a much more expensive server for you to acquire. Okay. Um, how's the pace so far? Do people feel like this is enough, or am I going too fast, too slow? So far, so good? Okay. All right. Okay. So, in a perfect world, we want to see these nice little hockey stick kind of curves. Things are kind of plateau as you just have a few, and as you get up higher with a number of uh, CPUs, things are going to go through the roof. That's how it's supposed to work. That's what everybody talks about in school, and there's, it, it's just the way it's supposed to be. But what really happens, it never really gets that high. There's a lot of different bottlenecks that come into play. My, my work as a consultant is focused mainly on MySQL, so I see a lot of the kernel mutexes and other bottlenecks that MySQL introduces as you try to go to more CPUs. So on MySQL, MySQL can be a problem when you start to get up to like this 64 range. Okay. Sometimes it can get even a bit slower. Uh, it, again, it's workload dependent. Um, the best thing that you could do if you're a big enough buyer is maybe get a try and buy from your provider. If you're working with Dell, maybe they'll ship you a server that has 64 cores so you can give it a test. And if you like, you keep it and pay them for it. If you don't, you send it back and you get lesser equipment. But that's been used with a number of our own clients as a, as, a, as a competitive advantage. They can go out and source to figure out if they need to spend 20 grand on a server with a lot of CPUs, throw their workload at it, or do they go somewhere around 32 or 24 cores? So it's a way of kind of bending the vendor to say, I'm going to give you $100,000 one way or the other. Can you just help me out by letting me do a little try and buy here? Okay, that's hardware. On the flip side, if you're going to go to the cloud, how easy is it to spin up a larger instance? You should be doing that. You should be taking advantage of the fact you have this raw capacity there. Try your workload on something higher until you get to this, this degradation here where it starts to tip off again. Okay. Okay. So, when you get into MySQL, and I'm going to talk mostly about 5.5, but and as you get older versions, 5.1 and 5.0, these things problems get worse. It's like any piece of software; it gets better as it as it ages. Okay, um, so what happens a lot in MySQL, and this is still a problem going into 5.6, is there's a number of different kernel mutexes that happen, and what effectively that means is it's going to stall out the database server for some fractional period of time. Okay, by itself on a low, low concurrency workload, that's not that big of a deal. But if you have a server that's doing 10 or 20,000 queries per second, that's just zipping along, these kinds of mutex problems are going to turn into slow uh, stalls or slow response time to queries. And depending on your application, you might be very sensitive to that. Okay? Um, so, so those are things to watch out for. Um, you also need to make sure that, uh, that other types of locks that are being held within the database don't also start to get in, in your way. Okay? Um, Things like row log locks, uh, gap locking that can happen on the primary keys in InnoDB, those can all be sources of places where you're going to see uh, a lock or a stall happen and potentially block other queries. Okay. So just, I guess I probably could just jump over this slide. Um, but basically, things were a lot worse back in the day. We've been getting better at it. 
um, we'll see in 5.6. Uh, the adoption hasn't been as quick, I guess, as, as, as we'd hoped on 5.6, or maybe it's going at the rate that we want. Um, but net effect is there's not a lot of customers out there yet on 5.6 in production. So um, Percona, I, I don't feel comfortable yet quoting where, where it's going to be. We've got some workload tests that, that we've been working on, um, some OLTP loads, some sysbench type tests. Um, so we've got some theoretical what should these workloads do, but we're still waiting for probably another few months for customers to come back and say, look, 5.6 is a huge win. We've eliminated a lot of mutexes. But um, right now, 5.5 five is really what, what a lot of our customers are running on. OK, so CPUs, sticking on that topic. Um, they can be good and they can be bad. Um, having a lot of CPUs mean you can get a lot of work done. That's what you'd expect. Um, where it can become a problem is as your server as a whole gets loaded and you start to get up around 75, 85%, you're going to start to notice that a lot of the jobs are starting to wait on getting access to the CPU. And you may not have that visibility directly in it, but as you're, as you're aware from a theoretical perspective, um, jobs are starting to queue. And that means if they can't get CPU time, they're going to be sitting in a block state. So you might be able to notice this using tools like VMstat and some other tools that are, that are monitoring your system for you. But what you'll find, the net effect is, you might see performance drop off before 100% CPU utilization. So being low utilization is OK. As you get up around 50%, you're probably in a nice sweet spot. But as you start to get up somewhere around 70 80%, things might start to slide off a lot. And certainly at 100%, you're, you're going to be CPU bound, and you're not getting as much throughput. Your queries aren't responding as quickly as they potentially could be. Okay. So when you're out there shopping, what do you do? Well, it depends. It really does depend. Um, you do want to get the fastest CPUs you can afford. But you probably don't want to go to the highest end because that's where the vendor has probably got its highest margins on it and it's going to cost you the most. But that's, that's a decision for you to make. If you're flush with VC money and you don't know what to do with it all, yeah, go out there and buy what you can. Okay, but not everybody has that option. So. Um, Keep in mind, in MySQL, uh, I won't comment on other database services, it's probably different, but in MySQL, one CPU is busy with one thread, or, one, or conversely, one thread is on one CPU at a time. We don't yet have a way for a thread to be split across multiple CPUs. Okay? Um, so if you have a concurrency in your database of you know, 24 or 30 queries running, you're probably going to be using all your cores. Already, I hope your database server is only doing database work, so you assume those 24 cores are dedicated to the database server. But the significance is, is that if you're starting to get threads running higher than the count of CPUs you have, you could be starting to get yourself into a bottleneck situation. So watch for that. Um, again, we talked about this really quickly. More cores, going to be more concurrency, 24, maybe 32. Okay. Um, most common architecture is on 64-bit. I don't see a lot of customers these days on 32-bit unless they made a mistake. So um, maybe this is a little bit outdated. But significance is you want to be on 64-bit. I think even the smallest Amazon image at one gig will already pop you onto a 64-bit operating system. OK, so what do you do to watch this stuff? Well, when I get on with customers, I usually see two or three different customers a week. I don't know anything about them until I get on to help them with a the problem or help them with a the project. Um, ideally, they're running Linux, because that's where I'm most comfortable. Fortunately, most distributions have VM stat, IO stat, and a number of basic tools always installed. Those are the ones I go to, and these are the ones that work the best. They're, they're battle-tested. They've been around for years. Probably everybody in this room is, is familiar with it. What are you looking for, though, in VMstat? Well, I probably should have highlighted a little, this, little bit better, so I don't know how well we can see it in the back. But I look at basically two different sections depending on, and we're still on CPU here, so depending on what, what, what's happening in CPU. On the right-hand side, these are the typical things you see when you run top. Okay? You're looking at where is the CPU spending its time? Is it in user space? Is it with the system? Is it actually idle? Or is it waiting on a block device somewhere? In this case, we see a server that's actually doing quite a bit of wait time. I would say that probably anything above 15% is a source of concern. I'd talk to a customer and say, we probably need to do something about that disk you've got. And that's usually where the problem is, but it could be blocked on, on network as well. Okay? Um, the idle state and, sorry, the system state is more, more of the kernel level thing. You're not going to see probably too high of a number in there. 4% is probably already kind of high. Um, and then the user space. If you're a CPU-bound workload with MySQL, that's where most of the processing is going to be happening. That's where you're going to see the highest numbers. The other two numbers that I'll watch, though, for, we already see we've got some high numbers in the wait column. When you look over at the first two columns, you've got the, the running and then the blocked. The B column is that I'd be eyeballing and saying, well, look, at some point I had 11, 13, 10 different processes or threads blocked waiting for something to happen. So 
this server has some measure of contention going on, probably with its disks. That's the first place I'd look. Okay. Um, if you also want to take another view of it, you can look at exactly what the, the CPUs are doing. You can use MPSTAT to do that. Okay. This view here, where you do pall, will show a split of all the CPUs and also summarize them. So generally, the value along the all line should match something of what VMSTAT is saying for where the CPU is spending its time. But what's significant is you can watch MPSTAT if you're concerned that maybe one CPU is getting pinned all the time. This will very clearly show one CPU doing 100% and the rest of them idle. Okay. So in that case, MPSTAT can help you diagnose when you've got um, a thread that's, that's a very busy thread itself, but it's not actually utilizing all your cores. MPSTAT can show you how well all your cores are being utilized. Okay, so any questions before I move on about CPU? Any, any angles of your own or any change, differences of opinion with anything I've said? Are the extreme processors that much more effective than the, like, a, like a high-end i7? I don't have any experience with that directly. Anybody have any opinion on it? I guess that's mostly just cache adding. Yeah, I, I, it's my own uh, unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with with those specs, but um, certainly having more cache on the on the CPUs is, is more beneficial. Can you remember to repeat the question so it gets on tape? Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, the question was uh, it was a difference between the extreme CPUs and the i7s. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So MySQL. MySQL is a database server. It uses memory. Why does it use memory? It needs to cache things. Because again, when we go back to that earlier slide where we talked about the speed of retrieval from different sources, RAM is a lot faster than going to disk. So if you can cache things in memory, you're much better off in terms of responding to queries. Um, we'll talk a little bit where it actually uses it. There's a number of different components in MySQL that do use memory. Um, we'll talk a little bit about wh what kind of memory size is appropriate for you, how to determine what that should be. And we're going to look at does it actually need to all be in memory, or sometimes can you depend on the disk being fast enough to satisfy your workload? OK. So where does MySQL use memory? It's got three main areas. They're not all one third, one third, one third. Okay. By and large, in assuming that you're running InnoDB, most customers are, most people are these days. Uh, if you're not running InnoDB, you usually have a very specific use case. You need full text search until InnoDB 5.6. So the reasons for using MySIM are kind of going away, but there are some niches. So I'm going to focus most of this on InnoDB. Okay, well, InnoDB has this beautiful piece of it called the InnoDB buffer pool. And its purpose is to cache database pages in memory. The point of the cache is that you avoid that disk read. Okay? When you start up your server, it's a cold cache. Your queries right off the out of the gates are kind of slow coming off the disk. But once they're in memory, they're going to be much more accelerated. So um, we want to minimize the number of IOPS we have to do to the disks, and we all, that also minimizes the latency in terms of retrieval of those database pages to satisfy a query. That's why we do it. Okay. Um, the other two areas, we talk about different types of buffers. When a client connects to the database server, in some cases, it will, before it even does a query, it acquires some amount of memory that is dedicated to different types of buffers before it does any work. So um, I've often noticed with some customers that have that, that maybe don't know any better, they might have two or 3,000 concurrent connections all the time, and they just stick around all the time, and they're on a low memory box. Well, that could lead to problems, memory starvation, for other things like the buffer pool. Because these buffers, maybe 2 meg or 4 meg here and there, times 2,000 connections, can start to become a significant drain on, on a server. So my point is, is that just by virtue of having connections in the database, you can start to see memory gets, get wasted. If that connection isn't doing any work, it's of no value to stay connected to the server. It's a drain on that server. It takes away resources from other components. Okay. Um, and the third part uh, where we, we have some memory going is, um, is in things like the .frm files. These things get cached in memory. Uh, the bin logs, these are things that are, that are using some measure of, of memory on the host. Um, the binary log are what help us uh, set up a replication environment so we can have slaves and, and offload some of our reads. Okay. Those depend on the OS cache. So some measure of memory gets allocated to that. OK, so um, oh, I'm jumping ahead. I'm sorry about that. So the, the, the file system cache, uh, by and large, doesn't get used by InnoDB. Most customers, depending on, on their setup, they'll be running with a, a battery-backed write cache. And that means that you can use a, 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 a setting called odirect. And that means that InnoDB is going to talk directly to the disk and avoid doing any secondary caching in memory. I'll take a step back. When you're typically working with, with Linux and you, you read a file into memory and you make some changes to it and you save it to disk, 
it will also remain in Linux's cached memory. Okay, so there's, there's a certain amount of this RAM. If you, if you are running your desktop for a while and you, you run top and you say, well, look, I've got two gigs on this box and my actual RAM usage is only around 500 meg, but all the memory is actually being used. Well, if you look at your cache column, you'll see that there might be 1.5 gigs or some measure of, of, uh, of memory utilized there. The significance is those are caches of disk objects they've retrieved up and maybe flushed out the changes, but they've kept them in memories for faster retrieval for you to use later on, much like the InnerDB buffer pool works. Okay, so that's great for regular Linux work. But when you've got a database system that is tuned to be aware that it's running on Linux and has its own memory management for buffering data, you don't want it to do that twice. So when you set odirect, you tell it bypass that Linux file cache, go right to disk for your operations. Okay? So that lets you say, I can ignore for the most part that Linux file cache. I can devote most of my memory to the buffer pool. Um, so the, the, um, the per session buffers that we talked about, there's a variety of them, the sort, the joins, and the read buffers. Um, some of those, like I said, get allocated right away. Some of them actually get allocated when that condition arises in the database server. So if you looked at your server and you said, on a connection, I'm going to allocate maybe four megs to some, to some buffers. And then as it does more complicated joins, they could start to acquire greater than four megs worth of memory utilization. So um, the, what I'm trying to say is that there are some memory allocations that happen immediately, some that happen as you, as you issue different types of queries later on. Okay? So these are all things that you need to factor in when you're sourcing the size of the memory that you want to use with MySQL. Okay, so a view of, of, of a couple of different ways to see how much memory is being used. The, the free command on MySQL can show you where your memory is actually being utilized. And this is what I was getting into with the 2 gig desktop that might have 500 meg resident and 1.5 gig in cache. This is the number over here, the 16,649. 16, now that's generally a number if you're running InnoDB only that you can safely say, well, that amount of memory I could probably push over into the buffer pool if you're ready to do a restart of your database server and expand the buffer pool. That's about the amount of memory that would be safe to migrate over. I would be cautious though, when I start to look at the server and I see some element of swap, I may not want to be too aggressive with moving data into the buffer pool because memory allocated to the buffer pool will be consumed all the way as database pages get read up. Well, the impact of that, if your buffer pool plus other memory requirements of MySQL get greater than the actual RAM in that server, you're going to swap. That's what Linux is supposed to do. It doesn't want to crash the binary at least as a last resort. If you start swapping, though, that's really bad if InnerDB buffer pool memory gets swapped to disk, because all the algorithms that have been written are on the condition that the access to RAM is extremely, extremely fast. And those algorithms fall apart when some component of that is actually on a slow disk. So it behooves you to make a mistake by choosing a smaller set of, of memory, smaller InnerDB buffer pool size than you think you need, rather than going the other end. Don't go too big. Better to go too small. Okay. If it starts swapping, if anything in the buffer pool swaps, the performance is going to go through the floor. Okay. And this is an indication here of, of some swap happening. It doesn't necessarily mean MySQL caused it. Could have been some big file transfers going on. A couple of other things could have been happening. But the significance is I'd be cautious on a box like that of giving too much memory to the InnoDB buffer pool if I saw any swap happening. The other view of actually how much MySQL is using, when you look at show engine InnoDB status, it's going to show you how much memory is allocated to the buffer pool in terms of pages. And each page is a 16K page, and how many pages are actually utilized, and how many are actually modified in memory. And I'm going to get into this modification number later, but the significance right now is showing that out of the buffer pool, I think this is uh, around two gigs, the, the free buffers are zero. So we've used our full, our buffer pool is completely filled up. Now, of that 262,000, only 258,000 are actual cached pages. Because in the buffer pool, we're storing other things. We've got adaptive hash indexes and insert uh, buffer um, going on in there. There's a number of different utilizations for the buffer pool beyond just caching changed pa uh, database pages. Um, but by and large, you can see right off the bat that most of this is cached pages. Okay. And I'll, co I'll come back to the modified in, in just a few minutes. Okay. So back to this. Why do you want to have it in memory? You want the reads to be in memory because they're faster. Okay. If you can minimize your disk, uh, your disk reads, your performance will be faster. Um, the, 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 the challenge is, is that not everybody has the simple paradigm where they say my data set is this size and I can go to Amazon or my server that I'm getting already has this much. Most of the time your data set is larger than your memory. Okay? So that, that presents somewhat of a problem. The concept is that, that, that we use is, is a working set. 
your working set is generally somewhere between 1 to 100% of your data set. So we'll pick some easy numbers here. You've got a server with 50 gigs. You've got a data set of 100 gigs. You know that in that data set, it's been around for four years. And you've got, it's for, for your online website that maybe sells widgets. You've got all of your sales history for the last four years. Now, out of that 100 gigs, you are probably not checking the sales history from three years ago or two years ago. You might be once in a while doing some historical graph and, and looking back and forth to see how you're trending versus last year's sales numbers. But by and large, the activity in this database is going to be what was sold in the last 30 days, 60, or 90 days. Okay? So out of that 100 gigs, we don't know yet what the working set is, but it's fairly easy to say it's going to be something less than that. If your business model has been pretty steady, probably one quarter of that will be the actual working set of what is actively being accessed and queried by your users, by your website. Okay? So assuming your working set is about 25 gigs, your buffer pool should be around 25 gigs. That is, that is your working set. Now on your 50 gig server, beautiful. All of that just fit into memory. And you can basically walk away from a problem like that. But if we, if we kind of change it up a little bit, if we say, well, no, no, three years of my history are always active. My working set is actually 75 gigs. Then that exceeds the RAM that you've got in that server at 50 gigs. Well, what are you going to do? We need to make some trade-offs now. OK, so again, if everything's in memory, no brainer, piece of cake. And for a lot of time, you can get away with just buying this way. You don't have to go into some complicated figuring out what the working set is. You can just say, look, this year Amazon's biggest sale was a 68 gig box. Now I think they've got up to about 240 gigs or 220 gigs, something like that. Now, it does cost a lot more. But if the trade-off is you just have to throw a few more bucks at the problem, that's probably a lot easier than having to do some other architectural changes that involve developers and potential bugs and things like that. So in a lot of cases, it's just easier to throw money at it, buy more RAM for your, for your AWS instance or for your physical server. Okay. And that's, that's generally what, what I'd recommend to a customer where they've got a, a working set that is somewhere around the, the RAM capacity or within RAM that I know they can generally afford to buy. Okay. Okay, so if it doesn't though, this is really where the crux and the, the thinking is going to come into it. If it doesn't fit into memory, we need to make a trade-off here. We need to get some measure of SLAs out of the business. If it's just a one-man shop doing this thing, well, you're probably not going to get any formalized document. But if you're working with a larger company, maybe they tell you that you know, the queries need to come back in some order of seconds or milliseconds or something like that. They give you a number to pin. Okay, once you have that kind of a number or an understanding of how quick things need to move, then you can start to look at the different types of disks that are out there and debate with your customer or, or with yourselves, um, how am I going to approach this problem? Are we going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to buy the highest quality disk to render the quickest performance? Or are we, is it acceptable for us to come down the spectrum, maybe get SSDs instead of PCI flash, or maybe get a much larger rate array of SATA drives? Somewhere in, in the mix in there is going to be where your trade-off is going to happen. OK. okay. So, if all of that comes together and you're already buying the best quality disk you can, you haven't been able to shard, you've got this single monolithic database, and things still aren't fast enough, what are you going to do about it? Well, you can still make some changes. Okay? The first and best change to make, this gets away from the hardware perspective, but it applies to any database out there, change the query, or at least look at the query. You want to read back less rows. That is the goal here. Okay? If, the, if the client expects to see 100 rows, a perfect world is you answering the query only had to examine 100 rows. Okay? That's where we want to get to. Now, it's not usually feasible, depending on the way the data is laid out and the way joins have to happen, but that's where we want to go with it. Um, where, where, you know, um, Percona helps a lot of customers. We go in and we see you know, they're doing like hundreds of millions of rows, and they're only returning maybe 10 or 50 to, to the client. Those are classic cases where it's not even about the working set anymore. It's just about query improvement happening. And my reason for bringing this up is that very often the queries, the database schema is, is neglected to the end. So it behooves you to spend some time on this, whether you're facing a memory problem or not. Just take a look at your queries. You're probably looking at more data than you need to. OK, enough said about that. Um, maybe you can archive some data. Maybe your workload is such that you're sitting on five years sales history, but your OLTP database that it's facing right now only needs to work with the last 30 days. Well, archive out that data, move it into a warehouse, or move it onto a slave, but put it elsewhere, and let the app deal with having to read that data set on its own. Okay? So by virtue of that, you're going to reduce the data footprint on disk. You're going to reduce, hopefully, the size of the indexes and the pages that are being read into memory. Okay? Um, there are some also other options in terms of compression within uh, InnoDB. You can compress at the table level. 
That might be uh, advantageous to some people if they're using blob or text columns. That can save up a lot of disk space. Okay. Um, and finally, this is a, this is a this is a case where um, doing it up front can often really benefit you in the long run. When you start up your website and you've got this great idea, you go and you just say, well, I don't know how big this column of IDs is going to be. I'm just going to make them big int. Well, in my school, that's eight bytes. That's your primary key. That's going to be appended onto every secondary index you've got. So eight bytes seems like not a big deal when you're dealing with a few thousand or hundreds of thousands of rows. But as we get into data sets that are maybe measuring in millions of rows, that's, that's a non-insignificant non, non amount of memory that's being utilized by too large of a, of a, of a, of a column size. Okay? Where maybe you could have made a change is gone to an int, because you're still going to be able to store 2 billion at an at a signed value. So you've got these simple fixes where you can, in, by, by virtue of changing it from a big int to an int, you can go from 8 bytes to 4 bytes. Very quickly, you can have the size of your primary key and off of each secondary index have a significant impact of reducing the data set size. Okay? This, you know, it costs a bit in terms of your alter table. There's some tools out there that help you do it in a non-blocking fashion. But definitely do revisit your column types and make sure you're using the right ones. Okay? Big int is often a classic case. Do you need to store you know, a potential count of all the ants in the world? Probably not. You know, four billion out of an int unsigned is probably going to be significant for most people. Okay. So this is a slide that actually Peter showed yesterday that I stole from him. Um, and it shows a comparison of different types of disks and the, the transactions per second that they can drive. And the numbers themselves are interesting, but really what I'm trying to show here is that as you go from a certain amount of memory allocated, so we're talking at the bottom end of the spectrum, only 2 gigs of a buffer pool on an 18 gig data set. Okay, so we're saying that all that 18 gigs are working set. The RAM on the server is obviously greater than 22. It doesn't matter how much RAM we have. We're saying we only want to cache up to 2 gigs in the buffer pool. Well, when you're, that makes you a disk-bound workload. So what we see is that the faster the drives are, the more transactions per second you're going to get. But as things move to the right and as you get to your entire working set of memory, they all plateau. So at some measure in between is you're going to have this trade-off. Do you want to spend for the Fusion I.O. and the Viridant type cards, the flash-based ones? Or are you OK with a performance that maybe a RAID 10 on some SAS drives can deliver? knowing that there is some spectrum difference in between here. Okay. Okay. So this touches on something we were talking about before, where, where things are getting buffered. In a lot of cases, we want to tell NODB, stop buffering. Okay? That's why we run things with odirect. Have it talk directly to the disk drives. But typically in Linux, the reason we do this buffering is not only for, for offloading from having to do a read later, but buffering it also allows us to perform sequential writes to drives. Let's not forget, over the last you know, 20, 30 years, all we had were spinning platters. And that meant that a sequential read or a sequential write were orders of magnitude faster than random reads or random writes, because it allowed the disks to keep spinning in a reliable fashion as fast as they can and keeping the, the heads in the right place. Okay? Um, when we go and we get these SSDs and these flash drives where there's absolutely no penalty, basically, for doing random operations, all these algorithms that we've developed and, and tuned and tweaked for 30 years kind of fall flat. We don't need them anymore. I mean, we've got different problems that come up. You know, we've got write leveling that has to happen with these, with these drives, so we wear them evenly. And different problems come up. But this sequential I.O. versus random, it goes away, for the most part. So what we're doing is we're going to say to the OS in a lot of cases, just stop trying to be smart about it. We know we're saying MySQL knows what it's doing. Let it do its own work, talking to the drives. OK. So why, how does it do some of this stuff? It uses the f-sync call, by and large. Okay, and f-sync is basically going to quiesce what's in, what's in the buffer down to the disk and makes it durable. If we don't have it durable, then we've got no way of knowing that if that server crashes at this point in time, what data are we potentially going to be exposed to losing? Okay? The database is going to do it in its own way. It's got its own series of log files that track changes through the database and then later on does its actual purge to the actual hard IBD files. Okay? Whereas the, the Linux file systems typically have their own journaling operations going on as well. Okay, the ext ones, the ext3 and 4 have a journal, and so does XFS. Okay, um, by, uh, I guess on that point, don't use ext2 because it doesn't have a journal, and you will probably corrupt your database if you continue using that. But I probably nobody's doing that. So, okay. So, how does InnoDB work? When you're doing a read, and this is kind of a step back, and probably a lot of you already know this, but how does it work? When you do a read and it's not in memory, you got to fetch it from disk because that's where the data is durable. It will move it into the buffer pool. Okay, when you do this big select. 
and you're looking at whether it's from an index or not, it's going to load these files from the disk into the buffer pool. Now, keep in mind, it's a 16K block uh, database page. It's 16K on disk, and it's 16K in memory. It's like a one-to-one -one mapping of, if I fetched up three pages from the table space on disk, it's the same three tables, uh, pages in memory. OK? Oh, sorry. I forgot I had transitions in it. OK. Now, when we go to actually make a change to the database, the, the simple case is the select, where you're basically it's just a pass-through cache. The, the first time through, it's slow because it comes off disk. Now it's in the buffer pool, and it gets satisfied to the client. Assuming you have no other caching layers between, from your, your web app to the database again, you go and you read that, that select again. It will just fetch it from the buffer pool. It avoids the disk lookup. Beautiful. OK. But now what happens when you want to change data? If you've got data that's in memory or on disk, it doesn't matter. That data page has to be fetched up off of disk into memory before InnoDB is going to make a modification to it. So an update statement is going to either cause a disk read, or it won't, but it definitely will cause some disk writes. Now, there are two different types of writes that are going to happen. The first write, and this is, again, optimizing for the case of the spinning disk where we're going to delay as long as possible making random writes because spinning platters are slow for random writes. We want, to off, we want to delay them as long as possible. We write what's called um, the InnoDB log file. And it will keep, uh, it's written in a sequential fashion. So it's very quick to write. It's an append-only type file. And it only ever gets read in the case of a crash. This is effectively the journal that tracks changes in the database. So how it works, a write, write request comes in to the, to the database, um, to MySQL. It goes into the buffer pool and says, do I have this page that I need to change? If the page is already there, great. It will modify the page in memory, and it will be classified as a modified or a dirty page. Okay? And what that means is this page is different in memory than it actually is on disk. Now, it writes the, the actual change set to this log file. And then it can acknowledge to the client, to the web app, to say, OK, I've committed this. This, this is a durable write. Well, we know it's not technically been durable because it hasn't changed the on-disk IBD file yet. And the IBD file is the actual database file that you back up and that you work with, that, that MySQL works with. This table space is the IBD files. Okay? So at this point, we've changed the buffer pool, we've changed the log file, but we haven't made any change to this table space. So the significance of this, but we've acknowledged to the client to say it's durable. So we better make sure that if the server power gets lost or something happens, that when we come back up, we're going to recover this. Well, the way it works is it will go back through its log file and look for any uncommitted changes that haven't been committed to the table space and actually affect those changes. And you might notice that if your database crashes and it takes a lot longer than normal to, to restart, and you're checking the log file and it says it's, it's doing crash recovery, that's effectively what it's doing is it's stepping through the log files and going, oh, I have some changes that actually weren't fully durable yet. I need to make those, make those, make those changes ch uh, effective. OK, well, in a perfectly running system where you might have some peaks and some valleys, the database can actually go ahead and purge those modified pages out of memory. It's got some background threads that will do this work for you. And the, the benefit to this is, is that it will keep those log files from having too much of a changed data set in them. If they get too long, if there's too many changes, your crash recovery time is much larger. So we try to keep that, uh, keep that as small as possible. Well, if the database server gets slow, and MySQL senses that, it will go and it will start flushing its modified pages and committing them to the table space. Okay? So the database server's trying all these different algorithms to make sure it can flush change pages in the buffer pool to disk, but it also tries to do it in an intelligent way. It's got algorithms built in to make those changes in contiguous blocks as often as possible, with the, the expectation that if they're contiguous on disk, that they're probably going to translate into a sequential write so that it optimizes for the spinning platter case. Now, when we go to SSDs and Flash, where there isn't that penalty, where you're not trying to optimize for random writes, there are some tuning options. Um, I know for sure in Percona Server, and I think in, in community version as well, that you can say, just flush them as you need. Don't try to make any like, you know, area-based or anything else like that. Just flush like crazy if you can. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, there might be trans yeah. transitions on it. OK. Um, I jumped ahead of myself again. Um, so this isn't uncommon. Um, I'm, not, I'm not very fluent beyond MySQL, but my understanding is that Oracle's got this concept. I'd be surprised if things like Postgres don't have this as well. So anybody want to comment, say yay or nay on that? OK. OK, so 
This used to be slow. We know that. This is a slide deck that we've been working on for a number of years. It used to be really easy to say that. It's not the case anymore. Back in the day, even when the Flash stuff first started coming out, it was $30,000, $40,000 to get into it. And not a lot of people could afford that. But these days, it is considerably cheaper. It's something that you should be thinking about. Maybe SSDs are, are appropriate for you, but certainly the Flash is, is a very attractive option for disk. Um, so, but in some cases, you still need to touch the disk. Okay, depending on all the things we talked about with the CPUs and the memory and the disk configurations and what the buffer pool is doing, you still need to touch the disk. Okay, so the buffer pool, it's going to cache. It's going to cache those reads as much as possible. We talked about um, some of the different examples would be, you know, sales history, um, maybe going back for the, for the current year. That, that's important if you run a lot of uh, reports based on that year. You want to cache that data. You don't want your accounting department telling you that things are always slow when I run this report. Well, if that's important to them, then you need to find a way of keeping that data cached in memory, maybe running that query on its own outside of the regular reporting period so that it stays in the buffer pool. Those are tricks like that that you can use to, to take advantage of the fact that the data is going to be cached in memory. Okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, reason I, the reason I'm calling out these kinds of things is it goes back to the working set. The, the data set, the working set, all these things, it's not always going to be active. You're going to say, well, my working set might be this size. But actually, out of that working set, the speed might only be important on something even smaller of that. Okay? So you've almost got three different tiers of approach to, 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 to the, the query response time that you're trying to satisfy for your application. You'll say, this is my largest amount of data that I've got, my 100 gigs on disk. Something smaller than that is my working set. And something even smaller than that are the queries that I really care about making fast. Okay? So if you're, if you're bound by all these types of determinations and you say, I simply can't afford to buy more, more hardware, I can't put more RAM at this thing, whatever, my working set doesn't fit in memory, well then try to figure out where are the most important queries that are going on, tune those as much as possible, but at least make sure you can satisfy the RAM size that would satisfy the result sets that you're regularly looking at. Okay? Um, and it, just to keep in mind that like for, for news sites, you know, only the really most recently active news posts are probably the busy ones. Yeah, they sit on multiple years, but they, they probably don't care about caching an article that, that was written uh, 12 or you know, 18 months ago. OK, so can you cache writes? Uh, not really, because by definition, you're, you're changing data, so you don't really have anything to, 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 to stage them in. But um, the good news is, is that in a lot of cases, when you're working with slower media, and I mean things more like uh, the RAID arrays on SAS drives or even SSDs, it does benefit you to go with a battery-backed write cache. And they're, they're fairly common. Um, they're not generally that expensive anymore. And the concept is, is that when you go to make a write to a spinning platter, it's going to be slower. If you can stage that and have it acknowledged back to the operating system or back to the database that that write has been committed, that it's safe, then you're golden. You can move on. Your database can say, I committed this. I can move on to doing some other operation. Okay? The way the battery back cache works is it's got some measure of flash or RAM and it stages that write, and it waits, and it does its reordering of its actual changes to the, to the spinning platters behind the scene. So the writes come in from the database, they get fake changed in this cache, and later on get actually committed to the disks, and your database server can much more quickly reply back to its client saying, okay, my writes have been committed to, the, to disk, we're good to move on. Okay? And generally they come with batteries, and you'd have to make sure you have a battery in it, because if the power goes out, anything that's in RAM could potentially be lost on these battery-backed write caches. Okay? One thing to keep in mind with them um, is that one of the drawbacks is they have to go into a learning mode every once in a while. And they, they often do this on their own schedule. There are ways to influence it, but watch out for this. Um, we'll often, Perquano will often get a 911 call that says, man, my databases were humming along, and then suddenly performance dropped through the floor. The writes just dropped off, and, and it's, it's, it's awful. What's going on? And that's the first thing we'll often check is, did your, your battery-backed write cache go into learning mode? That basically means it turns off that cache. So all those writes are actually being persisted all the way down to the drive, and it's much slower. You're getting a lot less IOPS, and you're getting a lot higher latency. So watch out for the learning, the learning component of your battery-backed write cache. OK. So um, when you're working in Linux, how do, you, how do you look at the performance of your drives? Because um, they're certainly a component of buying hardware. Um, <clears throat> the, the best tool that I've been using has been PT Distats, and it's nothing more than really a fancy wrapper around the proc Distats. Um, virtual file system. Okay, it just kind of formats it a lot now. I don't know if you guys have ever catted that, but it looks like line noise to me. But this kind of wraps it into a nice, nice view. Now, PT Distats is part of the Percona toolkit. Go and download it all, all day long. I think we're up to version 2.2.2 now. Um, this is built on a little bit of an older one, but 
the, the columns that are really significant to me are the ones that are mentioning how many ops, IOPS happening per second and versus how much the actual throughput is going on. So you're measuring the count of disk operations at the write and the read level, and then you're looking at what is the volume of data moving down to the disks the, in megabytes, the, the read and the write load. Okay? You, you, need to, you need to keep this in mind because your disk vendor is going to publish some spec to you. They're going to say, well, my SATA drive can do 100 IOPS per second, and it can do, I don't know, 20 meg transfer. Well, if you're watching with PT disk stats and you start to see your numbers are getting close to that, you've got a case where you need to start looking at buying some additional hardware. Okay? You need to know what your disk drives are capable of before you can draw really any true conclusions out of what, what PT Distatch is showing you. But it can also show you the inverse case. You can say, well, hey, man, I went out and I bought 10 drives in my RAID 10, and I've got a capacity of 3,000 IOPS. Or you bought some provisioned IOPS from AWS. And you look at your, your server, and, and the server's running fine. The app's it's happy. And you're only doing 100 IOPS per second. You might scratch your head for a while and say, I probably, I probably overbought. Not that you should go away from that, but you know, there are cases where you might have provisioned too much equipment and realized that, oh, OK, maybe I'm building for the future. A tool like PTD Stats, though, can kind of zero in on, on where the disk bottlenecks are or where you have some excess capacity. OK, so <clears throat> what's the difference? Well, SSD is still going to be using a different, uh, sorry, SSD is still going to be used the same um, uh, access methods that we're used to using with our spinning platters. OK, so we've got a whole bunch of different protocols we've been working on for years, the SCSI protocols, that SSD is still going to leverage. Um, the, the, the RAID controllers that go with SSDs, make sure when you buy them that they're capable of working with an SSD. Don't just assume because you can plug it in, your form factor fits and all that. It will, it will work like a disk drive, and that's great. But what you might be missing out on are optimizations that the RAID controller vendors build in when they say, I've got an SSD behind me. I can do these extra additional features. Make sure you buy one of the RAID array controllers that can actually take advantage of that. Um, top of my head, I think the Adaptec, the Z series, are suited for doing um, uh, SSD-based controller uh, disk drives. Okay. Um, if you if you got lots of bucks in your pocket, flash is truly the way to go. Um, I've been helping a customer with a flash I/O uh, I/O drive too, and I was able to show I think about 140 IOPS per second and something on the order of about a gig per second in throughput. So just disgusting amount of capability. And it, that that takes you in a whole other world where a single MySQL instance probably can't do that kind of work. You're probably in a space where you're going to run two or three databases on that single server simply because you have so much raw disk capacity available to you. Okay? Um, going away from flash, all the way back down to the bottom end of the spectrum, you know, if you take a lot of our laptops these days have SSDs, but if you have probably a spinning drive, you're probably around the 100, 150 IOPS. So you're going from 150 to potentially 150,000 IOPS, and you can buy somewhere in between that. And that's where your budget's going to put you. Um, the best thing I like about the flash, though, in SSDs as well, though, is that that latency is virtually nil. So that means when we're doing our writes or our reads, it's, there's virtually no cost to that. So it's, it's like almost having a second stage of, of, of RAM there. It's just so fast. OK, so these are just some benchmarks that um, Vadim um, Kuchenko, our, our CTO at Percona, he, he runs the SSD performance blog, and he does a lot of these types of evaluations for, for disk vendors. Um, we didn't mention exact. Oh, yeah, we do have the models. So these are the Intel 320s versus a RAID 10. Um, so the vendors just give us these things, and we, we test them out for them. And we're plotting the fact that as, you, uh, as we increase the number of threads, these drives scale great. We're getting up to 32 threads here, and we're seeing that our disk throughput is somewhere up around 350 gigs, uh, megs per second. So certainly less than what Flash can do, but for an SSD drive, that's pretty darn awesome. And that's on the uh, Intel 320, published in 2011. So this is already two years old. Um, but the point is, is that we can get some tremendous throughput uh, using these drives. The latency as well is also very, very great. So we might only be doing up to about a five millisecond latency as we get up to 32 threads, which is pretty darn good. Um, but as you're going up with your, with your RAID array, you can see that it gets, as the threads increase and more work is trying to be thrown at these drives, the latency response time in aggregate starts to drop off. So if you have a lot of different write operations in your database, if you've configured it for a lot of write I.O. threads, um, you could potentially be doing yourself a disservice to your RAID array if you're trying to force it to do too much work. You're making too much contention happen in the drives. So be careful with, 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 your, with your standard SATA drives or your SAS drives. Um, these days, SSDs and, and Flash are, are definitely going to be driving a lot better performance for you. OK. But one thing to keep in mind, as you start to fill up these drives, the, the, the problem we didn't have before, we didn't have anything like garbage collection to do on the SAS drives or these SATA drives. They just filled up, and you could use the full capacity in a way you went. 
But with these new, these new flash and SSDs, they've got these little cells on them and they're trying to make sure that all the cells get used appropriately and they, that, that it wears evenly because there's only a certain number of read and write operations these cells can do. Now, I'm not a hardware guy on this, so if I'm going to start going sideways, somebody please call me out on it. But the, the, the theory is that there's a bit of a black box built in there, that Intel is going to say, hey, look, I'm going to manage all of this garbage collection and making sure that the right leveling is happening appropriately. But at the expense that, as it goes to do this leveling, it's doing additional reads and writes behind the scenes to make things get evicted and moved around and shuffled. Well, as we get to a more full state, there's a lot less open blocks for it to be doing the shuffling. So performance is going to degrade because there's more ops that are happening under the scenes, thus less IOPS available to you at the application layer. So as, as we start to fill these bad boys up, they start to drop off. Now, it's not like they're going to ever perform as poorly as, 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 the, as the SAS drives and SATA and all that. But the point is, is that don't expect as these things get to full that they're going to be performing as well as they were at 50%. So um, you, know, you can get these Fusion IO drives around 1.2 terabytes and whatnot. That's usually big enough for most people. Um, or you can come down a lot lower. I think they're at the 300 or the, the 600 gig ranges these days. So for most, work, most database sizes, that's probably going to be adequate for you. OK, so um, again, the, again, it's all about budget. Can you afford it? Um, but also, can your app sustain? Does it need to have super low latency reads and writes on it? Um, the, with the number of customers that I've worked with, um, a few in particular stick out. The ones that tend to do the social media kind of work, they tend to be really focused on that user experience, and they want those, those latency numbers to be virtually nil. Now, maybe it also happens they have a lot of VC behind them, so they can afford it. But they tend to just say, I don't care what it's going to cost. Let's do the flash thing. Um, but on the, the other end of the spectrum, I might have a guy who's helping out, uh, um, helping out other customers with lead tracking, something like that, generating leads for them. Well, this guy, his business model is all about sourcing uh, clicks and shoving them into a database and then reporting on them later. He's going to have a high throughput of reads and writes, but he doesn't really care about how long it takes to generate his reports. So he might sit on a greater volume of data and be doing more IOPS than our social media person might be, but he's so much less sensitive to how slow the drives are going to be. He doesn't really care if he's going to pay an eight millisecond penalty versus the social media guy that says, you know, I need some millisecond latency when I'm accessing my disk. So keep in mind, this is application workload dependent. It all depends on your budget, but also what can your app sustain or what user experience you're trying to deliver. Um, one big thing is that as you restart MySQL, you're going to be basically starting up your server with an empty cache, a cold cache. Now, uh, I know in 5.6 community, um, and also in Percona 5.5, we implemented a feature that has a, uh, a cache warming procedure. And the way it works is you've got your InnerDB buffer pool that has pages in it. What we do, you set it by virtue of every 10, 10 minutes, it flushes a record of all the pages that are in memory to a file on disk. And this file on disk might only be, it's not the actual contents of the memory, it's just you know, 16 or 20 megs, something like that. There's just pointers to database pages that were in the buffer pool the last time it did a, it did a, it did a scan of the buffer pool. OK, so that, that doesn't do you anything when the server's running. But after the server restarts, it sees that file there, it sources that file, and it loads all these pages into memory. So you get a warmed buffer pool after your server restarts. The reason this was significant, and we even had it in 5.5, is by and large, nobody had SSDs or flash. So they, they hated that restart my server, they delay it, they, they never wanted to talk about doing a restart because it was so painful, you know, rightly so, because the, the, the spinning drives took forever to read those pages up because it's all random I.O. When you do this buffer restart, you still are doing random reads, but at least you know which pages need to be in memory. You can get your database server back into a production state much quicker because you know what the data set was that, that was active you know, just before you shut down. Okay. Okay, um, so this is just a quick comparison of the different RAID levels and where you can get um, some performance tweaks out of it. Um, it's something that, you know, that probably most of us are all familiar with. Uh, the, the recommendation, if you can afford it, is generally to go with the RAID 10 because you get the best of both worlds. You get some, some mirroring of the drives and plus you get a stripe across them. So you get the highest throughput with the most, uh, the most uh, redundancy built in. Um, don't ever do RAID 0 on your database server. Now, Sometimes we'll recommend it for, for slaves if they're disposable. But generally, with a RAID 0, if any one of those LUNs under the hood crashes, your whole data set's gone. So that's probably not where you want to be. Uh, RAID 1 is fine, but it doesn't really help you accelerate a lot. Um, but it does give you redundancy. And RAID 5 is, is fine for a read workload, because you're just, you have a number of different drives you can source from. But a write operation is quite poor in a RAID 5 array. Uh, and that's because you've actually got four operations it has to do. 
So you need to do two reads and two writes to commit a change. Your write is change the actual data on disk, but also commit that, um, the, the checksum value to another drive. So rate five writes, not very good. Okay? Uh, generally, with, with a lot of customers, instead of trying to get into, like, do I put my logs here, my buffer pool there, I'll, or sorry, do I, do I put my IBD table space there, generally, a RAID 10, pack everything into it, and just, just be done with it. OK. So um, what can you do with your, with your disk caches? Generally, this is all happening at the hardware level. Um, you don't want to be doing this in software unless you have some measure of, of making sure that it can be committed to disk. And I'm not familiar with any, um, with any that can actually do this properly. So um, you know you can use the, the MD devices using the, uh, the uh, software-based RAID array. Definitely use that. It works like a champ. But there's no built-in write caching that happens with that. All of this stuff happens at the disk controller level. So you want to have it in a, in a write-back. So that means that it's doing this caching component of writes, where it will basically acknowledge to the database to say, I've received your write. I'll acknowledge back to the database, let the database go on with its work, and later on, I will actually flush it to the drives. OK. Do you go with a SAN or a NAS? It depends. Um, and it's, it's interesting, because some customers are already invested into already having a SAN or a NAS environment at the shop, and that's just what their, the storage person says they need to do. Now, direct attached storage is going to give you the lowest latency. It just has to, because there's less hops. There's less things it has to go through. Going right through the PCI bus, that is the, you know, about as quick as you're going to get. Um, as soon as you put a SAN or a NAS in there, you've got, if you're talking about NAS, we're talking about maybe iSCSI or NFS or Samba, SIF sharing. Okay? Now you've got network hops to go through. Now you've got different protocol stacks to work with. Uh, you were talking about SAN. Maybe you're talking about fiber channel. So now you've got fiber channel switches, which are wicked fast. But they still, they still have a lot of uh, latency that they incur. I mean, it's, it's, it's work. It's happening in a CPU. So it's time that's going to be delayed. Now, the advantage to it, don't forget about the beautiful facts of SANs and NASs. You can do things at the storage layer that you can't with local storage. If you've got a large environment, you can start snapping your data set and copying it to another server very, very quickly, doing all types of different types of cloning operations. SANs and NASs have their place. But if you're, they're, they're, they're not necessarily appropriate if your goal is, is number one for performance. So keep all that in mind. OK. Um, I've, only, I've got less than two minutes, so I'm going to move relatively quickly through these. But one component of, of sourcing hardware is that you want to do a lot of alignment. You want to make sure that when the database server is talking to the file system and talking to the, the RAID controller and talking to the drives, that everything is aligned. Okay? All the sectors line up so that when we're writing blocks of 4K or 16K, that they're also 4K or 16K all the way down to the storage level. That's gonna, that could give you anywhere from a 10 to a 20% improvement. OK, uh, network, uh, generally, you're going to be working with at least gigabit. If you can go even bigger, that's getting to be more and more common. Um, that will generally introduce less latency. So if you can afford to be 10 gigabit on your database servers, go for it. But generally, 1 gigabit is what most people are using, and it's, it's more than adequate out there. Um, definitely do try to do trunking if you can, and, and bonding of the devices. So um, what I'll often see is most physical servers will come with two NICs. And they'll, they'll cable them to two separate switches. And then in Linux, they'll, they'll create one virtual device, like a bond zero. And that will be in potentially an active passive mode, or, or they're both active going out both directions. The point is, is that because you've got things cabled to two different switches, this, this device can, can allow for a failure of one switch or one NIC card and still keep the whole system flowing. You don't want your hardware at the NIC level or at the switch level to be making your database unavailable. And these are really simple things to implement. So um, look, definitely look it up. Bonding uh, uh, within Linux is, is very easy to do. OK. Um, what, what can you get with EC2? There are huge instances now. You can get um, up to, I, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's 244. I think it's 224. But anyway, um, a lot of RAM. You can get SSD back storage now, which I think they'll give you like 80,000 IOPS on, on their system. You pay a lot of money for it. But if you need it, it's there. So you can do a lot of great things in the cloud these days. Um, EBS is, uh, we call it unpredictable because you get a lot of noisy neighbor kind of thing going on. If you've got somebody else on your shared storage, they can impact the performance of your database. Um, so uh, you can get provisioned IOPS these days where they give you a guarantee of how many IOPS you're going to get out of that, out of that LUN. So if you can afford it, the, the PIOPS are the way to go. Um, RDS, and I don't, think, I don't know if this is official or not, but my, my take is that it's basically a front end to, to EC2 back end databases. So you, you won't pro necessarily get any better throughput with RDS. What you will win with that, and this is the Amazon relational database system, they'll manage the database and all that stuff for you. So you're not even buying anything. You're basically paying for a database server 
that you can read and write against. And all the other stuff gets handled automatically. Backups and setting up slaves, that's somebody else's problem. That's all within the GUI of your uh, Amazon. OK. Um, so uh, some of the problems that we're going to run into, uh, disk I.O. Can, 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 is always going to sneak up on you. So that's why we talked a lot about the different types of disk products that you can buy out there. When the database gets slow, it may not be a bug in MySQL. It may not be app bug. It might just be your disk disks are saturated. Um, Conversely, your CPUs can be a bottleneck. We looked at some of the tools to track for that. VM stat, um, uh, MP stat, and, and even top can show you that, oh, look, I'm a CPU bound workload, or I'm bound on my, I'm waiting on disk. So there's a lot of different tools out there that can point to, to where your bottleneck is going to be. Don't assume that just because you can add more disk drives, though, or more CPUs are going to fix it, it might be that you need to go back and actually fix a query. Okay? So throw money at it for a while, but at some point, that's not going to be enough. OK. Um, with slaves, replication is single-threaded. So the, the common mindset is, well, I, don't, I have this old server. I'll make it a slave. Well, that's fine. But as that, as that slave starts to pick up more workload, as your app gets busier, the slave won't be able to keep up necessarily with what's happening on the master. Because all those write events are all single-threaded. They're all um, going to be applied in a single thread on the slave. Therefore, you're going to be spinning one CPU as hot as possible. And you're also going to be only uh, able to keep up so much in terms of replication lag from the master. So, what often mean that it means is you need to have actually faster CPUs on your slave than you do on your master. Sometimes counterintuitive, but something to keep in mind. Um, again, I touched, I touched on this quickly. With the fastest flash drives, out, uh, flash drives out there, you might be running multiple instances of MySQL on the same host simply because your CPUs aren't busy, the disks aren't busy, and you have capacity. So there's nothing wrong with running MySQL on, on maybe all on 3306 on different IP addresses that you stand up or uh, on one IP address on different um, ports. Whatever makes sense for you. Okay. Um, but by and large, if you've got the time, do your own benchmarks. The SSD performance blog and MySQL performance blog, and lots of people have a lot of opinions out there. Don't take them as if they're the only way it needs to be. Go and do your own. Um, Sysbench is a great tool for generating different types of workloads. It has a file I.O. test and an OLTP test that help you generate activity against your drives. Um, also, tools like JMeter can help you simulate the actual workload of your, of your database or of your app. It can do it uh, a variety of different types of tests. So uh, don't be afraid to use those tests in doing your own benchmarking. Not only um, will you be able to say to your boss or convince yourself if you're the business owner that, look, I'm investing the money in the right place because I need it, you also learn a lot about your app. Um, it, it, you just get so much deeper into how, how nuanced things are when you change a few connections here or, or make the queries a little bit more expensive or a little bit cheaper. So benchmarking benefits you in so many different ways. Um, these are things we already talked about quite a bit. Um, getting the working set smaller is certainly where you need to be if you can do it to make things faster. Change the queries if you can. Tune the OS. Don't be afraid to make changes to Linux to change different ways that it caches memory or um, changing the editor memory killer so it doesn't kill MySQL when you start to swap, things like that. Um, use the right storage engine. Uh, by default, InnerDB should be what you're using, but if you're using MySQL, reevaluate that. There are much better memory management components of InnerDB. Um, your schema and your application, that's where you would change maybe your queries if you had to. Maybe make them access less rows or add new indexes. And um, sometimes that's worth it. Sometimes it just a lot of changes to your app, and you could be afraid of that because it means a whole other development iteration cycle. So um, your mileage may vary on that. OK, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Um, but I, I'm happy to stick around and chat if anybody wants to. Uh, Michael Coburn with Percona, and I'll be here all day. Thank you. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. 
and with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. 
Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack.